Ever thought the devil made you do it? Why do you do what you do? And how does faith fit into it? Today, Brain Science and Belief with Dr. Ken Baugh. Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. Brain science and belief. Don't tell anybody, but I've gotten addicted to binge watching a series on Netflix. No, really, don't tell anyone because the language is way too graphic and the sex on the screen won't pass any Sunday school test, but the storyline and the imagination is simply overwhelmingly compelling. The series is called Outlander, and it forces one to contemplate the cultural, medical, and spiritual dynamics in the mid-20th century compared to the mid-18th century. How would you handle life? If you woke up tomorrow 200 years back in time, imagine the differences, beginning with no lights to turn on, much less thermostats to adjust or prescriptions to take. So why don't we just keep that line of thought going for a minute? In the Christian world, it wasn't long ago that Catholics believed um, the Protestants were all heretics and Protestants thought the Pope was the Antichrist. Psychology as a specific field of study was not even born, as myths and superstitions abounded in the areas we might call brain science today. You were doing something crazy? What were we supposed to conclude if we don't know about brain tumors, chemical imbalances, and personality disorders? Rushing forward to today, Do you wonder why you are struggling with faith and relationship issues in ways that seem unique? Do you question the prescriptions which are supposed to take the edge off of your anxiety or depression, still finding yourself unsatisfied? Does trust in God seem to elude you, making you long for the faith you see in others? Let's ask someone who has pondered these things for most of a lifetime, founder and CEO of IDT Ministries Institute for Discipleship Training, and former pastor of Coast Hills Church right here in Orange County, and Aliso Viejo, welcome Dr. Ken Baugh to Church Hurts And. Thanks, John. It's great to be with you. Ken, let's just set the context, and since we're talking about psychology, what happened to you as a kid? There had to be something... Yeah, well, we all have our stories. I would say probably one of the more defining uh, experiences of my life was when my parents divorced when I was five. And the way that I internalized that dynamic and the back and forth and the just the challenges that were going on in the family uh, system, I interpreted that as rejection and abandonment and feelings of shame and, and such. And those really laid down kind of a narrative that really followed me for most of my life. And even though I thought I had processed a lot of things, I'd done a lot of therapy work, I'd worked through a lot of those dynamics, I just, I found that there were just more layers to it. You know, God is so good in that he can take things that have been exceedingly painful in our lives and bring good out of those things. And I'm, I'm certainly a testimony of that, but I would say that was probably more the, one of the more defining moments. Now, that reminded me when you said that, I mean, five, I mean, how, what a formulative time in life. And you don't really have a lot of skills and categories to put things in, but it reminded me of walking home with my daughter in elementary school. And she said, I wish you and mom were divorced. And I thought, what, (laughs) where did that come from? You know, I was really insecure. And she said, well, because Susie's parents are divorced and she has three grandmothers. And so she thought it would be neat to have three grandmothers. 
And for you, both your parents married again. So you had that whole dynamic as well. Yeah, we did. And and then both of my step parents had brought children in. My stepfather, he had a lot of older children. So we really didn't have a lot of relationship there. My my dad, my stepmom, she brought with her her daughter who was about my age. And so, and that was, that was good. My sister and I got along very well. And then my dad and stepmom had a, their own child together. So I have a half brother, but, you know, blending families is very challenging. And there's, there's just a lot of dynamics that go along with that. What else happened in your life that got you into the Christian world and is why you're here, but on the edge really was psychology in a training that ended up led you into the ministry and you have a lot of initials after your name, like I do, but what attracted you so much to the psychological side of things? I've always believed that God, the way God created us is going to inform how he is going to transform us. And it just made sense to me that under the umbrella of general revelation, the sciences can help to inform that, whether it's psychology, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, uh, neuroscience, what have you, from my perspective, those don't define what is true, but they do illuminate what this Bible already says is true, especially in regard to faith and practice. Okay. So when you refer to general revelation, you're talking about specifically what God reveals to everybody apart from the Bible, any specific book, but that everybody can kind of look out there and God has revealed himself in ways other than scripture alone, right? Correct. Yeah. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter one talks about how creation gives us a, an understanding of a creator. And whether you talk about intelligent design, whether you talk about just the beauty and majesty of the creation, but Paul even makes the point that even God's divine attributes can be seen in creation. So general revelation, as we understand it as theologians, is a profound lens through which we can see, can see the Lord. The way I sometimes put that is we have to work really hard not to believe in God. And I'm always reminded of C.S. Lewis, who said as an academic, he was convinced that God didn't exist and he was very mad at him for it. (laughs) Um, But tell me, you've written a number of books, but tell me about the latest one, because it gets to what we want to talk about today. It's called Unhindered Abundance. Restoring Our Souls in a Fragmented World. And it's really my ministry manifesto, John. It's, it's my life narrative up to this point. I'm 57, so I've got some, some mileage on me. It kind of runs throughout the book. And I infuse uh, findings from both psychology, neurology, and theology into an understanding of how a person resolves emotional pain and how they actually grow to become more like Christ. And if one gets into the substance of that book, there's a real important understanding kind of of some categories that you bring forth, kind of starting with thoughts, if you will. Take us into the main categories as you see us working psychologically in layman's terms. To simply put, every human being has a body, which I refer to as material self, and an inner being that you could refer to as the spirit or the heart is the word that is used most often in the Bible. That's the immaterial self. And those two parts, if you will, are they, they work together and influence each other. When you talk about the immaterial self, our spirit or our heart, there's primarily three dynamics there, thought, emotion, and will. And the way I illustrate it in the book, it's they're like gears. And when one of those gears turns, it's going to turn the other gear. Now, all the engineers out there are going, wait a second, Ken, three gears isn't going to work. You need the fourth gear. And the fourth gear that I have there is basically our worldview. If we're going to believe what it is that we believe, our core beliefs turn that thought wheel that then turn the emotions, that turn the will, that then produce behavior or influence behavior. Now, our thinking isn't the only thing that influences behavior, but probably for this conversation, it is an important dynamic of what drives behavior. Our listeners go across the map in terms of their belief systems, but we have a pretty educated audience and they're sniffing beneath this. 
and they're saying, all right, is this another, is this like the Christian version um, or that already came out in the Christian version? This is the power of positive thinking. This is Norman Vincent Peale. This is Robert Schuller reworded. Or in a secular version, this is Oprah Winfrey. And just, you know, it's think good thoughts, meditate on the butterflies, the butterflies. Uh, really, do I really want to pick up a book that's just telling me that I need to think good thoughts? Yeah, well, I think that's those are great questions and valid. But there is some truth to all that you just said, because the way God designed the brain to work is that what what the things that we think about over and over and over again are what we move toward. It's just a basic dynamic of of, of neurology. And we move toward what we think about. So if you're going to be thinking about negative things, distorted things, if you're going to be worrying all the time, if you're going to be fearful all the time, that is going to affect your behavior. It's just a almost a cause and effect relationship. What we're talking about, or what I'm talking about in the book, is what we are choosing to focus our thoughts on. And as we choose to focus on what God has revealed to us through scripture, through the Bible, about who he is, who we are in our relationship with him, that then turns those, that thought gear that produces a different kind of emotion that then influences the will that plays out in behavior. So the, the science behind it of all of those things you said, whether it's Norman Vincent Peale, Oprah Winfrey and her guests, or the apostle Paul, uh, it's the science is the same. It's what we're focusing on and meditating on, if you will, and thinking about is what's different. You know, one of the things I've found really interesting these days is while belief in God seems to be going out of style, if you look in the with people who've really gotten in trouble, meaning by that, the addicts, the, the drunks, the, you know, those whose life has broken down, when they get into community, they're not shy about bringing God up. I mean, it's like Ray real quickly say, if you don't, if you don't deal with this issue of a higher power and that you're not the one in control, you're probably not going to get better. And it just astounds me. I'm waiting for political correctness to hit the recovery community, but it's slow in coming because people want something to work. And if you want something that works, sometimes it seems that God's an important part of that. Thinking on the good stuff, not the bad stuff really, really matters, doesn't it? It, it, it absolutely does. I think God has, when he created human beings, he placed in essentially a homing beacon inside of every human heart that draws us to him. And we can resist that. We can run away from that. We can pretend we don't hear that. And that produces one kind of life experience, or we can run toward that, embrace that, and all that that means uh, through a relationship with God, through Jesus Christ, that then produces a very different quality of life. You know, I want to get to Ken, what dragged you out to California, because you were really a successful pastor in Northern Virginia, working there with a, a friend of mine we were talking about before the show, but your ministry was just thriving. And you came out here and something happened that really is kind of a bomb. But before we get into that, let me just mention again, if somebody wants to get your book, uh, they can go on to what website and give what code? I think it's Nav Press, and the code is Ken, right? Yes. So, and all of you listeners can go to the navpress.com website and type in Unhindered Abundance. The book will come up, put it in your shopping cart. When you go to checkout, there's a promo code spot there. Just put in Ken and you'll get a 20% discount. And for more about you, idtministries.com. Yes. Yeah. Right. You can go to idtministries.com. We're in the process of getting ready to launch our own podcast. We're going to be posting a, a number of new videos to the YouTube channel. And so we're creating a number, a lot of content that we were going to put out just to, just to help folks. Well, super. Let me mention that I work for Standing Stone Ministry. Uh, really, we work with the frontline workers in the spiritual world, clergy and leaders, missionaries, realizing that they get discouraged, the church hurts them too. And so this ministry is offered to them because of your generous contributions. And 
If you're one of those who said, I'm, I really want to do that someday, if you would consider maybe doing it today, I want to thank you ahead of time if you do, as we continue to encourage others to live that and life, church hurts and, we know that church hurts isn't the end of the story. So thank you ahead of time for that. So let's get you to California. What brought you out here? Well, you know, God gets us where it's us to, to be. So a position opened up at a church that you mentioned earlier here in Southern California. We're actually from here. My wife and I were born in Southern California, went to Mission High School, and I was on staff at Saddleback Church after seminary. And then we went back to Virginia. We were there for almost 11 years and then moved back to California in 2004. And then I became the senior pastor at Coast Hills Church in Aliso Viejo. That was a, that's a big task. Wow. I mean, Coast Hills has been a great church for many, many years and you were there for quite a while. And then something happened that really messed up your head, didn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a casualty of some of the worst church politics you can experience, but more than that, it was just, I just hit a place of spiritual and emotional and physical burnout to where I I wasn't leading out of an abundance. I was leading out of scarcity. And that did affect my leadership. It did affect how I, you know, handled myself in stressful situations. And anybody who's listening to your podcast, John, who's in church ministry in on a staff position, especially, it is a extremely stressful role. And when you are the senior person in that organization, and that and that family because there's two competing dynamics going on there Mm -hmm. it's just constant and i work with a lot of pastors today i coach a lot of pastors and you know those that have been leading churches through this pandemic it is it has been so challenging in so many ways and so i think we're going to be dealing with a lot more of this this burnout reality in the in the next year to two to come I just, I read an article last week from BuzzFeed. They listed, somebody had posted, uh, here's the reason I left church. Why did basically, why, why did you leave church and got so many responses and the top ones, you know, that were approved oftentimes included just problems that people had with leadership themselves. How does the work that you're doing and had to do on yourself apply to that, to the the person who, and just it's becoming, the numbers are overwhelming of those who are just saying, this isn't relevant for my life. I don't want anything to do with it. And they're really throwing out God with, with it, or they're saying, oh, I'm just spiritual, not religious. How does that connect with the work you've done here? Yeah. Well, I mean, going back to even what we opened the show with, we all have hurts. And One of the points in my book that I talk about is that unresolved emotional pain doesn't just go away over time. It doesn't matter if it happened 30, 40 years ago. The brain has the capacity to store every experience that we've ever had. And so there is no past and present, if you will, from a neurological standpoint. It's more like a bucket. And a lot of our pain is at the bottom of that bucket that we've just layered stuff on over the years and stressful situations exhaustion trigger those things that then come you know busting to the surface and create a blast radius very often around us that take people down create conflict in churches and families you know lead to divorce lead to addiction as a way of numbing the pain pastors are not equipped with a worldview if you will to really understand that. And so a lot of the answers that they, they're doing the best they can, but a lot of the answers they provide don't get to the heart issues of the brokenness in a way that actually facilitates healing, change, and growth. And I think people over time just get to the point where, okay, pastor, I've, I've prayed, I've read my Bible, I've served, I've given, I've done all these things, but I'm still stuck. What's going on? And I think what I'm trying to do is provide a bridge that will help span that gap in our own emotional health, spiritual health and growth that uh, has tended to be left out of our discipleship process in the local church. And what's in that secret sauce that might surprise me you don't see in every other book? That's the sin that often is associated with 
rebellion against God is more often, in my experience, the result of brokenness and unresolved emotional pain. Mm. And it doesn't make it less sinful, but we, we, we got to go to the source, John. And so many churches just focus on the behavior. It's stop the behavior. What is the addiction? Is it porn? Is it alcohol? Is it drugs? What is it? Just stop doing that because they're identifying that as the problem. Well, that's not the problem. It's a problem for sure. But the problem is what's going on in the heart because what's going on in the heart is going to be played out in our behavior. So to change the behavior, we got to do heart work. And you can't just address the behavior and, and have change happen. This past Sunday, I had the chance to preach, and uh, I was thinking about, you know, Easter. It's like you get to preach after Easter if you're not the senior guy, right? Right. The senior guy gets (laughs) the big crowd. And then they bring in somebody like me, and I was thinking, really, what is after the fundamental Christian message of, you know, Good Friday and Easter, what are we supposed to do? And so I was thinking about that, and I had a couple Sundays uh, to preach, and one of them, I just focused on this uh, one verse where the apostle Paul says, literally says, but one thing I do. And I thought, well, I better pay attention. If this is, you know, this is the apostle Paul wrote most of the new Testament. He's saying, but one thing I do forgetting what lies behind. And then it goes on to talk about, and and most people just skip that forgetting what lies behind. I bet you don't skip that part. Do you? It takes some work forgetting what lies behind, doesn't it? Well, and I think, I think to your point, a lot of pastors and church leaders use that very passage in Philippians 3 as a no psychology, you know, it's like go back and resolve the unresolved emotional pain of your past and such. But that's not what Paul's talking about in that passage, John, and you know that, right? Is that he's talking about all of his accomplishments that he had been dependent upon as uh, righteousness before God. And he goes on to say, I consider those dung. And the Greek word that he actually uses there is, dung. is, <laughs> is more like human excrement. Yeah. He's being intentionally graphed. So he's saying all of my spiritual trophies, I'm a Pharisee. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm, you know, I mean, you talk about having letters name that guy had them all. And he's saying all of that is superfluous compared to knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll give you my sermon outline sometime, but it, ha- it had a bucket, and it was seven things in that bucket, and I asked for forgiveness for having a seven-point sermon, but I did it in <laughs> an illustration-wise, where like Sunday school. So it's your head, it's your feet, you know, it's good stuff, it's about, it's the everything, man. we have to deal with it, and we need yeah. help, and that's why it's going to serve us well to go out and, uh, and, and get your book. Uh, and tell me um, a story of somebody who applied this stuff and you saw the change in their life, won't you? Oh gosh. I remember I was, uh, so one of the things that I do is I, uh, I'm part of a a teaching team at a ranch in Southern Montana. And we do these five day intensive discipleship cohorts with groups of 15 to 20 guys. And there's a, there's cohorts for women too, but I don't lead those. There's other folks that do, but we have guys that come from all over the world. So we have military, uh, first responders, police, firefighters, we have teachers, we have executives, pastors, missionaries. I mean, it is a representation of men, just men being men. One of the weeks I had a couple former Marines who had seen a lot of combat and had were really struggling with PTSD. And after one of the sessions that I taught, one of the guys pulled me aside and shared a story with me about his experience on the battlefield where his commanding officer was killed right next to him. And he believed that it was his fault. Mm. And as we talk through that, it was clear to me that he was taking responsibility for something that was not his to take responsibility for. And as we talk through that, I remember John, he had his sunglasses on, so I couldn't see his eyes, but I remember as we were talking, he started tilting his head like this it's kind of like, forgive the analogy, but like my dog, when I'm talking to my dog and, and she's trying to understand me, she does the same thing, right? But I could just see on his face, it was like something new was dawning on him that he had never thought before. It had just never dawned on him that it wasn't his fault. And so 
that just that validating that and empathizing with that and carrying that burden with him, even for those few moments, really led to, uh, and that was a couple of years ago. Uh, I have a friend of mine who's been kind of working with him and the progress that he's made as a result of a new way of thinking, it's been followed up by a lot of other things for sure, was just foundational to his recovery from a very distorted way of, of thinking. Well, unfortunately, our our time is up, but how thankful we are for that. But also, you know, this just brings up, I think for both of us, how many people are struggling after many years in life with with things that just seem insurmountable that really don't have to be. And and I think your book is one of the ways that people can begin to work through that stuff. And and so let me just mention again, navpress.com, uh, promo code Ken. And, uh, you know, Ken, thanks a lot for being here today. Um, hopefully we get to talk more. Let me just say this before we close. Years ago, I went to my mentor, R.C. Sproul, specifically asking for counseling. And R.C. was primarily a writer and an academic, not one given easily to requests of, for personal counseling time, but he reluctantly gave in. As we sat in his living room outside of Ligonier, Pennsylvania, with colonial blue wing chairs and the buds of spring green dominating the trees outside the window, I... Uh, tried to get up the nerve to ask him why I had wanted to meet. My teenage years were coming to a close, and I was very serious about my Christian faith and my studies. Despite this fact, um, every unguarded moment of my mind was filled with girls, and my urge to merge was off the charts. Now, I'm not sure how I specifically worded my question, but I know that the sex charge underpinnings didn't elude this perspicacious man who, uh, who saw almost everything. What do you do when your mind tells you that one thing is right and your feelings tell you the opposite? There's so many ways to put that, but perhaps the song comes to mind. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? You run to meet me and I reach out I reach out my arms. When I hold you close, it makes me feel so warm and we'll slip away and be together tonight. How can this be wrong when it feels so right? You listen to the rest of the words of that song. They talk about how then they go home and put that aside and hold another close. How can that be wrong when it feels so right? You feel the emotion as you listen to it. So R.C. sat back and simply said, let me ask you a question. How many times have you gotten in trouble for doing what you knew was right? And how many times did you get in trouble for doing what you felt was right at the moment? It wasn't enough, but it helped. It also helps knowing that at the age of 20, that's the normal peak time for testosterone in a male. It helps knowing everyone else struggles with thoughts like these. It helps even more navigating these waters with those who care. If you're struggling today, reach out to somebody else. You don't have to do this alone. It's worth a thought. For Church Hurts and this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today, won't you? Well, that was worth a thought for sure. And brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end and enjoy God today, won't you?